It was great to go outside and see the stupa. See, that's what I wanted to die. It's the right size stupa. It will never be the biggest stupa in Canada. It's the right size stupa in Canada and in North America and in the world. It's hard to build the right size. <laughs> Not try to outdo the others who are building stupids. Because there are other things to do than to build stupids, right? <laughs> build the right stupid and then do the other things that need to be done. Like, you know, hold, you know, seminars for study hold meditation retreats and so forth. That's, you know, otherwise, unless your thing is just building stupids, <laughs> which for some people it is, right? Mm -hmm. Some people it is. Mm. That's their way. <clears throat> you know, for some people, devotion is it devotion to the guru and so forth. It never it was just my way. But, you know, occasionally it comes out. And, and uh, there was one time in Dharamsala, arriving in Dharamsala, and, you know, conditions very difficult and so forth. It was way back in the 70s. And, uh, you know, the idea of having a refrigerator having clean food or having a place to shit or there wasn't the street or wasn't the shithole that overflowed and things like this. Uh, you know, where these were all very desirable things. <laughs> I have a fridge, wow. And um, one day at the temple, which was actually when this type of thing, this actually was during this series of discourses, uh, 16 days, uh, four to six hours every day, uh, which was just fabulous, really. I didn't expect it to be fabulous, actually, because I didn't know the Dalai Lama at all. You know, it was just somebody chosen from childhood. I thought, that. You know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> just choose from childhood, you could get anybody. <laughs> and, um, but I gradually become very interested in what he had to say. I first noticed that he spoke very loudly and very clearly and very quickly in Tibetan. It was all in Tibetan. And, uh, wow, hmm. yeah, he speaks loudly. Oh, it's very clear. <laughs> it's very quick. It, kept, it made you pay attention so quick. And, uh, and, you know, that was all that I noticed in the beginning. And then gradually there were things that, you know, really put things together for me. Often very little things. Very little things. Uh, I've been studying for some nine years <coughs> at that point. And uh, so, oh, I think, oh, that was interesting which was quite contrary to what I expected, you see. It was good to start with low, low ex expectations, even negative expectations, really. Somebody chosen by the government, right? <laughs> Who's the most famous person in history in Canada? Tom From the past. <laughs> <laughs> From the past, right? So if you had an incarnation of that person appointed by the parliament, how much belief would you have, right? And then gradually, 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 not necessarily even within the 16 days, but afterwards reflecting on things and so forth. Oh, there's some interesting stuff there. And when I finally had an audience with him, I said something like, well, there were several interesting points that you made. And then I thought, 
Oh, that's rather arrogant. <laughs> and I looked at him, and he was just beaming. Like, what were they? <laughs> just beaming, just delighted. I forgot why I started all this. Hmm. Lecturing. Oh, yes. And at some point during the lectures, um, there was uh, this on the stages of the path to enlightenment and talking about making offerings to the guru and so forth. And, you know, so I started doing that. And it was of all the things that you wanted and so forth. So I started offering refrigerator and, you know, my home in Virginia and all the, you know, the, and so this is guru devotion. And this is something that, you know, I'm just. Mm, I can't say I didn't usually do something, but it's not something that, you know, is at the core of my practice of Buddhism. It's not. And, uh, you know, I just did a lot of it right there at the time during this ceremony that was being conducted, you know, as a little part of these 16 <coughs> days. Um, and it had a tremendous effect. You know, giving up all this stuff that I was lusting after in the midst of those 16 days of, you know, in the midst of great hardship, in, I can say great hardship in India. I'd gotten very sick with mebic dysentery and so forth. Relative to my life, great hardship. And tremendous effect through to the present day. So, you know, here's an example of a practice that I've heard about practiced a little, knew how it was done, was not enthusiastically into it, but knew how it was done. So then at the time when it came up, I knew how to do it and did it. I'll tell you about another one I did there too. Well, I won't. I'll have to think about it a bit more to get it right. Hmm. Yeah, there was quite a bit during that period. Right in the, in the midst of this uh, teaching. It was quite interesting. I, the place I was given, I told him I wanted to record his teaching. And nobody was recording his teaching. Nobody. Nobody. So I claim I was the first person to record this Dalai Lama's teaching. 1972. It was sort of like, well, he's going to be around a long time. We don't need to record his teaching. Yeah. I had an Uher five inch reel to reel tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> Expensive tape recorder. Mm -hmm. But recording on the slowest possible speed, 15 sixteenths, which is the same speed as a uh, uh, cassette now. You know, I, you can't say nowadays anymore. It was hard to buy one. And so they put me at an electric outlook outlet on the porch surrounding the temple, which was at a place where I couldn't see him. It was kind of cute. There was a, and there was a speaker above me, an electric outlet right in front of me. So it was, you know, I got <laughs> this kind of poor quality recording from this speaker at that time. And, uh, but I had electricity, which was at various speeds at various times. And that recording I put up on the, on the net. So... Anybody has access to it who can uh, understand Tibetan and can get through the various speeds of the recording and from which this book was made. Anyway, okay. So an example of knowing how a practice is done and making use of it at the time and making use of, for instance, learning about uh, mental factors such as belligerence. 
a metal factor. Uh, of belligerence. That the metal factor is, it's like an, an attitude that makes you want to hit. Another mental factor that I might be called verbal spite that makes you want to say something nasty. Interesting list of mental, very hard to translate, but when you look at the meaning that goes along with them, very interesting. And then you start noticing, oh, I want to hit that person. Oh, I really want to say something nasty. Oh. I just said something nasty. That must be, you know, mental factor of verbal spite. And then mental factors of holding on to, how do I translate? Transcend. Well, you know, holding on for a long time. To like years, years. What? Like a grudge? Yeah, grudge. Mm. Years and years. Still want to get back at Charlie Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> Kindergarten. <laughs> Beat me up. Right? God damn, Charlie Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> so, even if the apprehension of inherent existence or this agreement with the way things wrongly appear to our senses is at the root of all of these, this can be too deep. Too deep to be effective at the present moment. You go into the store and you see something particularly nice, right? And you want to take it home with you. It, it can be, you know, to reflect, oh, I mean, if you can do it, great. This is just appearing to be inherently existent, and I, I shouldn't assent to that appearance. If that can work, all the more power. All right? <laughs> but maybe you need some other kind of grosser type of realization, like, oh, I'd have to go to jail if I did this. <laughs> all right? So there are all sorts of levels of antidotes according to the situation and according to, to your capabilities. So, for instance, in training in compassion, if you've done enough of it, then may, maybe that's the one that's going to work in a difficult situation. Oh, you know, I should be compassionate to this person. This person's going to get herself, himself into a lot of trouble because of what they're doing. And so that should be what engages my response, which may have to be very strong, right? But it'll still come out of a sense of compassion for that person rather than hatred. You know, if you look into Buddhist texts to try to figure out what you're supposed to do in this situation or that situation, it's very difficult to find out. But if you look for a principle, yeah, I, you, know, you can find the principle. I think. And compassion is the one that, you know, if you trained enough in it. Well, maybe even if you haven't trained enough. Just even the name. I don't know. Okay. So, if you've been reading some of this, do you feel that hatred just comes directly from ignorance, or hatred comes by way of desire? Now he says, Hatred comes from lust. Lust comes from ignorance. In other words, well, for instance, 
when I walked outside, I saw those three balls out on the lawn. What are they made of? Clay. Yeah, they seem like clay. They look like marble or something like that from a distance. You go up and knock on them and they're, they're clay. And when I, you know, there was this very slight moment where I just saw the object. And he says in here, there's this like three ways of apprehending an object. You, you just sort of see it. It was very short for me on seeing those three. And then you, you ascend to the inherent existence that's appearing. It appeared from the first moment, but then there's the ascent. And then there's the, if it's attractive, right, I want it. So I wanted these for my home in Virginia, not for, the, not for Vancouver. A little hard to put my living room. A little hard. I did consider, uh, you know, wrap them in the rug or something. <laughs> and uh, so then there was the lust for the lust is a desire, but lust, I don't know, lust, the sort of wider meaning of lust for the three balls, which we call them. <laughs> And I went and knocked on them to see how heavy they were. I thought they'd look real nice in my place. In so that lust. And then Mm, what's uh, said so often is that hatred comes when lust is blocked, when desire is blocked. The way the words desire and lust are used in this book is desire is wider, like desire for enlightenment or desire to get out of cyclic existence or desire to help, which is not necessarily afflictive. But lust is necessarily afflictive. Lust is necessarily a problem. Desire is not necessarily a problem. The way the terms are used in this book. So when lust is blocked, you know, you want something. You know, the, the last, just to let you know, the last chocolate chocolate cookie. <laughs> All right? Mm -hmm. If somebody else gets it. <laughs> yeah, Barry. <laughs> so anyway, I made sure when she said she was going up to get the dishes, I said, don't take the cookies. <laughs> Even though I carefully arranged things so that, so, you know, Marilyn's smart. She'll know just to take the plate. But then, because I put the cookies and stuff over in the corner, and she'd know not to, but I, I don't take the cookies. Because <laughs> you see, she was a potential threat. A <laughs> little bit of potential hatred, or a little bit of hatred, maybe. Something. Even though. She was helping me, and I'd already figured out. She's so smart, you know. She'll know. Anyway. Somebody, something, somebody, some situation blocking, right? It can be a situation. Like, fire is going to destroy the home we built this summer, right? So, you hate the fire. The, the fire that's about to engulf mm -hmm. the place. Slowness talks about his mechanic in Tibet who got so pissed off at his car, underneath the car, that he banged his head against the chassis and hurt his own head. Anger at the thing that gets in the way of what you're seeking to achieve. 
so there's some lust for what you're seeking to achieve, right? So anger sets in at the object that's preventing the achievement of the object of lust. That seems to be more words than is necessary. <laughs> But you get the point. <laughs> but sometimes it seems as if hatred just automatically sets in, right? As if, like, some political figure appears in hatred. I think that's because we already know that pattern is already there. This person is blocking the achievement of blah, blah, blah. You think so? I don't. I, I think that it probably is the case that first there's that ignorance, that is the apprehension of inherent existence, then there's lust, and then there's hatred. But the lust may be in the past, okay? And the pattern of hatred may have already set in. So that as soon as you see that person, that object, that situation, the, you know, you don't need present ignorance, present lust. Hatred is right there. So, it's probably important to realize the, the causation that went into that hatred. The ignorance, the, the lust, and now we're stuck in this situation of, of hatred. So in undoing the hatred, it'll be important to see the lust. And it may be too difficult to, to hope to undo that ignorance, even if we're working on it, but not that impossible to, to look at what the lust is. What lust is being blocked, right? Be aware of the lust that's being blocked. There's nothing complicated about that, right? Or is there? Is there just hatred without lust perceiving it? That's what I'm asking. So let's take political individual. Yes, an example. that's what's in my mind. Yeah. That political individual is blocking the achievement of something, mm -hmm. is not, is preventing something that we see as desirable. Mm -hmm. And so immediately, <laughs> the hatred is there. God damn so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So then that hatred becomes habit. Hatred becoming habit, yes. And the fact that it's habit may be what's preventing us from undoing it. I mean, he, he, as he keeps saying, hatred prevents us from good judgment. If we want to oppose some person or some situation, hatred isn't going to help. <clears throat> Concern is going to help, no question. Nobody's asking that you not be concerned, but in order to take effective action opposing that person or that situation, you've got to have good judgment. And hatred is going to destroy good judgment. Effective counteraction. So that's why it's said that lust is more pernicious than hatred. Hatred looks as if it's worse, but lust is more pernicious than hatred. <laughs> Not to say you let hatred go and, and only focus on lust. <laughs> so, you know,
there's no. I think that's. sense helpful nothing strange nothing strange but uh, what well, that's a lot of impact through uh, familiar boundaries. The object of hatred is, what well, the claim here is that the object of hatred is over-concretized. So the object of the lust is over-concretized. Not so. And the object of the lust is over-concretized. And the over-concretized or itself is that ignorance that assents to the original appearance. That's hard to deal with. So there are other techniques for dealing with hatred and, and lust. For hatred, you know, you're cultivating, you cultivate love. You work on that. Tremendous, wonderful meditations cultivating on love that loosen up your mind a great deal. And so you see, by loosening up your mind that way, you become more open to understanding something about ignorance and thus to, to understanding something about wisdom. Meditations for uh, countering lust, like um, meditating on the insides of the body that one so ardently desires. <laughs> mm. As if it were, instead of covered by skin, were was covered by serene wrap, right? One of my students, a very funny thing, said to me. She said, "You've got eyebrow. What is it? What is this eyebrow? This what is this <coughs> eyelash? Eyebrow here is growing straight up." And she said, "No one would like you." I said, "Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> Such a tiny thing." I mean, if you had goobers hanging out of your nose, you know that it might be difficult to give up. I should do that sometimes. You could have some plastic goobers hanging out of your nose and put them in before a lecture. You know, especially when you're being filmed. <laughs> you know, put it right on this side. You know, and people are sort of squirming. <laughs> <laughs> Handing you Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. You know what it's like when you get some, you know, some real hairs hanging out of your nose, and you go home at the end of the night and you look in the mirror and you smile a little bit and then they really, you know, with the smile they particularly hang out, even with a mustache, they don't look good. <laughs> you sort of have an excuse with a mustache, a little bit. Doesn't quite. You can comb it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try. But even goobers, you know, they're, you know, never mind, you know, having a bloody nose on the spot or throwing up. <laughs> I 
I remember somebody threw up one day and I went over to look at it because I sort of have a doctor's mentality. I went over to look at what they threw up. They said, oh, wow, you're really strong. <laughs> As if you should be totally frightened of what was inside the person. Mm. Nagarjuna has some very funny statements about, you know, he advises. He says, well, I, I don't know the order of what he says. You, know, you can, you, you know, look at what's at the organs. That's what you're lying on top of. <laughs> and he says, if that doesn't work, you know, he's talking to a man, he's talking to a king. He says, imagine that it's your sister. Oh. And then he says, if that doesn't work. <laughs> That's very funny. And then he says, imagine that it's your mother. <laughs> oh, you have to have a sense of humor to read this. And he says, if that doesn't work. <laughs> then meditate on emptiness. <laughs> sort of like it's the last resort. But of course it's the hardest. <laughs> so it's like it's hopeless. <laughs> yeah. And within it is a recognition of how powerful lust is, you see. That that these other meditations might not work. You know, it's like you're in the store and there's, there's a diamond watch. And, you know, you have to think, well, I might have to go to jail for 10 years. And if that doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> what's next, you know? <laughs> you know, you can't say, meditate on emptiness. <laughs> But slap yourself. So Often, or almost always, these teachings are given in the context of uh, entirely eradicating lust and hatred through fully developing wisdom and thereby eradicating ignorance. Well, okay, that, that's great. But, you know, this has to be done gradually. Uh, apparently, there are, you know, a few individuals in world history, who, you know, undergoing su sudden enlightenment. Uh, but the real test, I mean, it's laid out for gradual progress, and so this has to work as a gradual therapy. And so, uh, to put this immediately in the context of nirvana and uh, getting rid of absolutely all afflictive emotions and so forth is, uh, it's like putting too much pressure on, on the doctrine itself. Um, and that some afflictive emotions are built on misperceiving the nature of phenomena uh, is rather easy to understand. And to, I think, to approach it that way and to see if some progress can be made and get some experience that way can be very, very helpful. Uh, and as a theoretical matter to posit uh, the complete, you know, complete liberation of the mind, well, that's interesting enough. But to, to limit the scope 
of this kind of teaching to that is quite unnecessary. Quite unnecessary. It's a great therapy. It's a great therapy. Like how to undo some specific problem that you have. Some specific hatred, for instance. Look at the lust behind it. And then try to look at the at the idea that you're holding on to that's behind that. The over-concretization that's behind that. And to get to to insist that you get down to the subtlest level or something like that, it's admittedly too hard for us to do right at the present moment anyway, so but to keep reading about it and so forth, that's very helpful. So now, your car. Did you check? <laughs> Given that people do leave their keys in the car, we should have gone out <laughs> and rolled some cars back, you know? Put them in neutral, rolled them back. Even without the keys, if they left them unlocked, right? You might be able to take them out of park and two or three of us together, we can roll them back some. And then there would have been sort of a like this, you know, about the car. <laughs> so, the next phase is um, one way of doing the next phase is to think about the basis of designation or the what's called the basis of imputation. Sometimes we call it imputation, sometimes called designation of the car. And initially this is uh, like very, seems very disconnected with ordinary experience. Although, as I was saying earlier, it's not for little children or, those of us, or for those of us who never grew up. <laughs> uh, maybe one advantage of never having children. Uh, as my mother used to say, don't be so literal. Uh, the basis of designation of your car. Ah, uh, time to switch. <laughs> So the base of designation of your car, how many doors does it have? Two or four? Or five? Four? Mm -hmm. Anybody have five? Mm. Two? Frugal folks. Are you sorry you have two? <laughs> <laughs> Two's okay? We have a moonwolf too. Moonroof. 
for escaping. You, you think you could? Mm -hmm. sure. You probably could. I went down the backman to the rope, you know. You think you can get out of that? Moon wolf. Moon oh yeah, right. Yeah. Opens up. Yeah. You could still open it. He's always trying to make trouble. <laughs> 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 but okay, that's fine. Uh, so you got six or five? Six. Six. Uh, which you call a door. You call it an a door. Opening. Okay. okay. Six doors. Um, engine. We don't want to detail too many parts. Get too awkward, right? Roof. Hood. Front bumper. Back bumper. Couple axles. Four wheels. That's enough. So it's basis of designation of your car. So you base of designation of the car and the car. Base of designation and object designated. Now if a trick is being inserted, this is where it's being inserted. Okay? If if you're being manipulated, this is where the manipulation is coming. But, but, play with it for a while and then say, I'm not going to play this game or I'm willing to play the game but I realize it's a game, you know, whatever. My mentor at the University of Wisconsin, my non-Tibetan mentor at the University of Wisconsin, Richard Robinson, called it a shell game. Totally fake. He wrote a book called Ooh, Early Madhyamaka in India and China. He and I became close friends. He loved to argue. He loved to not just argue, fight. He wanted his graduate students to fight him and defeat him. And if you defeated him, you became his friend. Which I did. <laughs> <laughs> within Chinese Buddhism. <laughs> Just happened to know something from, from a Tibetan text. <laughs> Defeated in one, two, three. <laughs> from then on, no more fighting. <laughs> he, he even stated it. He wanted to fight. After his death, I met his father. He was, Robinson himself was a big guy. His father was shorter, sort of fat. Oh, he was pugnacious, his father. You could see why Richard liked to fight. Somebody would kill his father. <laughs> but then he was willing to be your friend. Anyway, how did I get on that? Show game. Anyway, if this is show game, maybe it is risk. Uh, object is, uh, basis of designation, object designated. Base of designation, okay, uh, so many doors, seats, steering wheel, etc. Okay, those things, all those many things. You got to be willing to, this is yoga again, but it doesn't feel like yoga at first. And then, my car. And there's a, a couple once asked me, how can we make more progress with regard to meditating on emptiness? And they're maybe about 10 years younger than me. And uh, I said, well, uh, Look into object designated, whoops, object designated, and base of designation. And we went through a lot of things. This house. What do we figure? Eight rooms? Ten rooms. These ten rooms, and we named them all, right? The base of designation. And Marilyn and Barry's house that they built, right? Object designated. Went through a lot of things. That's where things like the sun, 
top half of the sun, bottom half of the sun. Got to do something. That's the basis of designation of the sun. Okay? <laughs> banana. Do the same thing. Top half of the banana, bottom half, half of the banana. <laughs> right? It's hot in here, isn't it? But that, no, don't open that one. I know what difficulty that is. Could you open that? Oh, no, something. That's fine. I will show my beautiful stomach. <laughs> no, no, it's too cold. Oh, okay. I know. Um, I'm thinking of the sun, you see. Uh, water. Take a unit of water. Glass of water, right? Top half, bottom half again, you know? <clears throat> or slice it right half and left half. Or um, hour, 60 minutes, basis of designation. And I said, spend a year doing this. And I meant it. And they spent a year doing this. And they had to go to various places. They went to England and so forth. And they were riding on the train and they were doing bases of designation and object designated. In the, they told me a year later. I'd like to be able to say, and now <laughs> they've achieved enlightenment. <laughs> A year later we met and I taught them the next phase. Okay. So love. I don't, love takes place over time, right? At least it takes place over, I don't know, whatever it's got to be. Five seconds of love, or even one second. So there's the beginning, middle, and end of the second of love. Okay? Uh, it can kind of be like, uh, uh, what? You want me to say okay? I'll say okay, just to shut you up. Or, well, okay, beginning. Yeah, a well, second it would be divided into beginning, middle, and end. Sure, that's a sp each of them is a span of time. Yes. Okay, it's the basic designation of a second of love. Love in general? I don't know. This person's love, that person's love, this person's love. Okay? Maybe? I keep saying okay. I had a teacher who did that in Tibetan. He used to say, drink some wine, drink some wine. Oh, he said it to me thousands of times. I got so pissed off. I had to answer back, drink some, drink some. I'd say, drink some. <laughs> Sometimes I wouldn't say it. I'd sit like this, <laughs> sitting at the, on the floor. Month after month, drink some, drink some. <laughs> and then he'd say, Trace away! Trace away! <laughs> Force me to say it. I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> but it's because of him that I can teach. Because he kept repeating things. Endlessly repeating and repeating and repeating. Like he was packing sausage. <laughs> so like propaganda, you know, so I caved in. <laughs> now it was really until the point where, where I, I would think, okay, he's saying it again, can I say it to myself faster than he's saying? And then sometimes I could, sometimes I couldn't, you see, in Tibetan. So then, 
You see, that's how I internalized it. A little bit like propaganda. And uh, that's how I learned it. You know, rather than just having recognition when somebody else said it, it meant, could I say it all myself? When he began to lay out the 16 attributes of the Four Noble Truths, could I say them to myself faster than he could say them out loud? And that's how I got to say them. So then if I start to teach the 16 attributes of the Four Noble Truths, they'll come, well, most of the time. <laughs> Into that, and I just translate. So without it, I, no. This sort of, he said, not sort of, these essential teachings wouldn't even be there. I'd have to say, well, they're in my notes, so let me look them up in the book, or, right? But the jigsaw part of it, you know, doesn't take you long to learn. The jigsaw, still don't know what he was doing. Anyway, maybe he was keeping me awake. Or maybe he just couldn't stand to be the only one talking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so what about a nanosecond? A nanosecond of love. Love is a consciousness. So the beginning, middle, and end of the nanosecond. He, is, he moved on that one. I don't know if he's keeping himself away. But I was like, eh, do nanoseconds have parts? <laughs> Is there any unit of time that doesn't have parts? No. She's been propagandized by Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. If, some, if, if there was a unit of time that didn't have parts, then when, you, when the, those units of time, those units of units of time, couldn't aggregate. So, can you think of anything that doesn't have a basis of designation, either in terms of time or, like, this is, I think we'd say in terms of space, right? Mm -hmm. This part of the rug, that part of the rug, or the the fibers of the rug, base of designation, base of designation of your body, right? How many limbs do you have? Hmm? Four. 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 Tibetans say five. What's the fifth limb? Oh, your head. Your head. Yeah. We think of the head as part of the trunk, right? Right. <laughs> God, I've got this really part of my speech, isn't it? It's awful. I think it's because we think in our heads, whereas, whereas in the old days, Tibetans thought in their chest, and North American Indians used to think in their gut. One North American Indian came to the monastery in New Jersey and said, this is, yeah, you, you folks think up here and that's why you're all crazy. Because <laughs> you, you, and said that in Buddhist text, you, 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 this stuff is all fired up. He said that, you're all fired up up here because you're thinking up here. So you, you brought all this energy up here. So all these senses are senses are fired up. You can think wherever you like, here or here. It's culturally determined. We've been taught the brain is so important. I used to, as a child, think here. My brother came home from prep school one day and went to St. George's because my oldest brother got a Boy Scout scholarship there. So he had to go too. And he said, oh, you're thinking your brain. So I moved it from here to here. Well, you can move it here, or you can move it here. Once you understand that, you know, the older Mongolians, when I was living in New Jersey, uh, they were thinking real down deep. And you can understand why they moved around and their sense of 
you know, their sense of, you know, their words down here. Right? How they move. You can see it. You can feel it. How did I get on this? Oh yeah, that explains why this is a limb. Five limbs. So you got four limbs and, and a kind of odd-shaped trunk from their point of view, right? A trunk with a knob on the, on the <laughs> top of it. <laughs> uh, a thinking knob. <laughs> but now, world over, most everybody's convinced that the, the knob view is, is right. So the base of designation of the body is four limbs and a trunk. Four limbs and a trunk and my body. Right? Right? Right. <laughs> oh, <phew. laughs> I finally got some people to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they spend a year. They'll be like spending a year just, you see? So they spend a year just seeing the first step, the tree I planted, that would be the first year. The second year would be basis of designation and object designated, okay? really be something to have a guru like that, wouldn't it? You could put confidence in and you could move into the cabin that you're building down there. Isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. Very designed it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Around sunset, sunrise. Both? Both. Wow. In the right side, stupa, on the other side, <laughs> side. Fantastic. Where's the stupa? Down there. She has a She thinks, oh, this guy's tricking me. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, it's not a trick. It's the avenue to, to getting at this perception, right? It's both a trick, in a way, it's a trap. It is a trap, but it's not a trap. It's not a trap, it's a key. Okay? It's a key. You, you can sort of feel it. If I ask you where the kitchen is, you can sort of feel, oh, this, he's, he's tricking me again. But it's not a trap, it's a key. Okay? I said, okay, instead of right, to show you how serious I am. <laughs> okay, really, it's a big key, big key. So you spend a year on that. <laughs> then you spend a year on basis of designation and object designated. And even you're trying to come up with something that doesn't fit. Now, of course, there are some realms of probably particle physics and so forth where you are going to come up with something um, maybe. Then, next step, because we're into the third year, I'm laying out a three-year, multiple-year retreat. Three years is not enough. 
in, in the third year, what is the relationship between the basis of designation and the object designated? Now the claim here is either they're the same or they're different. And the two hands here are pretty good. <laughs> and, you, and you'll see why Richard Robinson thinks this is a shell game. And either they're the same means this one gets, this hand gets lost in this hand. Okay? You then only have one thing, the basis of designation, or you just have the object designated. Okay? You just have one thing. Or they're different. And what Robinson is saying is only a nut. That, well, shell game, that's bad. But only a nut would agree to, to these rules. But these are the rules. Object designated, sorry, object designated and basis of designation, either they're the same and utterly the same, or they're different Utterly different. And this is where I sell you another book. <laughs> My emptiness yoga book, which I didn't bring with me, goes into this in considerable detail. And uh, it's When I came back from India in 1972, I taught two students at the University of Wisconsin about emptiness. And it's an oral teaching and a translation of the text together. And so it's very accessible and it's thick, it's long, and has a great deal of detail, and it does this kind of reasoning in in uh, in accessible detail. Doesn't cost too much. You can see it here: emptiness yoga. The key is, if the object exists the way it appears to you in that ordinary perception, then it would have to follow these rules. That's the key. If it exists that way, if it exists the way it appears in that, the way you saw it in that first year, then it would have to follow these rules. It's not that these are the rules for ordinary, well, ordinary, for existence in general. These are the rules for that type of pointable existence. These are the rules for inherent existence. These are the rules for such concrete existence. If it exists so concretely, it's either going to be exactly the same as the basis of designation or it's going to be entirely different. So you see, for this seemingly very intellectual 
basis of designation, object designated, bifurcation, to come alive, it's to see that the way things appear in this type of pointable experience, the implications of that are that the object is going to have to be exactly the same as its basis of designation or it's going to have to be completely different from it. The claim is not that we already think something like, oh, it's exactly the same as its wheels, or it's completely different from its wheels, because we don't think that, right? We're just pointing at it. We just got it there. We're not thinking. Oh yeah, there's the base of designation, there's the object designated, or anything like that. Anything like that. We're not thinking it's exactly the same as its roof, right? We're not thinking it's exactly the same as blah, blah, blah. Or it's entirely different, blah, blah, blah. But if it did exist the way it appears, then it would have to be exactly the same as its base of designation or it would have to be entirely different. If this can come alive for you, then the reasoning comes alive. It comes alive and it comes crucial. And this initial appearance becomes what you're investigating. And this is it's like You know, I'm looking into my basic perceptions. I'm examining that. And it becomes... Mm, fraught with emotion. And it's not some... Oh yeah, it's got to be the same or different and well... It, couldn't be the same because of blah 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 and it couldn't be different because of blah 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 and therefore it's not blah 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 and what's for supper? <laughs> <laughs> if it exists the way it appears and it's to see that connection if it existed the way it appeared even to think it couldn't change. And it's not that you're already apprehending that it couldn't change. Do you follow me? But if it existed the way it appear, appears, it couldn't change. Then you start thinking, you know, really, quite sensibly, well, no wonder we think things aren't going to change. You know, we get some, I get these ideas of, you know, you meet somebody and, you know, you feel very close and so forth and you think, well, it's never going to change. And then it does change. And you think, oh, well, that's how I got led into thinking it was never going to change. Because there was something in the basic appearance that was kind of going in that direction from the beginning. So the appearance of inherent existence, you can't say is the appearance that it's not going to change. But if it did exist that way, you see, if, then it wouldn't change. The fact that it changes opposes that appearance. It's quite subtle, really. quite subtle in a way, but if you see it, there's nothing subtle about it, right? <laughs> I guess. So you see, spending a year noticing, getting so you can notice 
without a whole lot of interference is well worth it. What was the second year? Object Basis designated. of designation, object designated. Third year is seeing that if it does exist so forthrightly, so concretely, or exists this way, like when we build lust on it, then it would have to be, it would have to follow these rules of being, it, it, it would have to have its own thing. You see, it would have to have its own thing. And if it's going to have its own thing, it's going to have to be the basis of designation, or it's going to have to be entirely separate from the basis of designation. And that, that's not, I don't think that's logic. I don't think that's, you know, it's framed as logic, but it's, it's experience of what it's like for something to appear as if it has its own thing and then to see, oh yeah, if it's going to have its own thing, these are its two choices. It's, it's going to have to be bulky. It's going to have to be <laughs> bulky. And it's got, these are the two choices. Nuance is out. Whereas for, whereas for existence in general, there's all sorts of nuance. And within Buddhist philosophy, we posit all, oh, when, when we talk about how things exist and so forth, there's all sorts of nuance, all sorts of games we play, of things being, having all sorts of difference within being the same entity and so forth. We've got all sorts of games we play within you know, within one entity you get all sorts of different things happening. But here we're talking about whether something exists the way it appears. Now we should have some trumpets blowing. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Announcing, you know, <laughs> some uh, music of the spheres. Well, what's the, can we have a Buddhist version of that? We have music of the spheres in Buddhism. <coughs> really deep. <laughs> oh, it's 3.21. We have nine minutes for... <clears throat> For uh, questions, I haven't gotten to his. Uh, Would you sign a copy of my book, please? Certainly. <laughs> Very kind of you. Yeah. At the end. Nick, Nick, at the end, please. At the end? Okay. Could I ask a question? I'm still a little confused on the difference between a trap and a key. A trap and a key. A pejorative way of looking at it would be a trap. Uh -huh. In other words, when I said, "Where's the the stupa?" She yeah. she could, a little bit she hesitated because uh -huh. she knew I was laying a trap for her. Oh. But actually, I was showing her a key. The key was the key is just to point, and <laughs> at the end of her finger was where the where the uh, where the stupa is. Mm -hmm. So what I was saying is, you might think it's a trap, but actually it's a key to promote understanding. Okay? okay. And similarly, with the shell game, you might think it's a trap, but I think 
really, it's a key. You might think it's a shell game, but really, it's uh, but really, it works. It's not a shell game. And it's quite hard often for people to put this together because number one, you're dealing with something that looks intellectual, uh, maybe intellectual is, is a very deep term, very deep term, but there's a superficial intellectuality this may look superficially intellectual, but really it goes very, very deep. And they, they'll approach it only on the superficial intellectual level and not see that it's connected with this raw level. Well, that's a good word for it, not bad. Uh, raw, ordinary level. And that the raw, ordinary level is dictating, dictating how this is taken. That if it exists this way that you picked up in the raw level, then that raw level is going to show you that this two-choice thing actually is appropriate. And thus, it's not a show. It's not a trick. It's not, it's not just on some superficial intellectual level. It's on a very profound intellectual level. It's also, I say, on the raw level. Because as you do it, that raw perception that you believe in, that governs your emotions, governs, truly governs. You know, when we go out tonight and roll your cars back, and you, you go out in the morning and you go, ah! Okay? That's governs. <laughs> and you come beat us up. Right? It's governs. You just beat us up. And we call the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And they come out of the horses. <laughs> really, governs. That's being affected. And as the fifth Dalai Lama says, at first it's like uh, having doubts about a friend, like you're losing something. You know, mm -hmm. Doubts about a friend, a long-term friend, mm -hmm. and you understand this guy's <laughs> been siphoning off your bank account over all these years, mm. you get these little hints, you know? Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't make a joke like that. So does it follow then that if you understand truly the, um, that, in, that phenomena can't exist independently, that that will dismantle hate and lust? Yes. If you understand this with its full impact, and it will at first have this, as the fifth Dalai Lama says, an experience like losing, like um, undermining, like uh, having doubts about a friend. But in time, it'll be like finding uh, a jewel that you've lost. It'll be like, uh, wow, you know, getting back something wonderful as you become more used to it. The thing that threw me off in here was when they started talking about the singular and the plural. Yes. <laughs> like, Isn't that a, I yeah, quite. a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, that's a hard one. And really, I, I recommend, uh, I was looking We'll sell a couple of books in the meantime. In this book to see if the fifth Dalai Lama, he has a little bit more explanation on it, but a number of the explanations are just as, as, uh, mm, I don't know if that makes that much sense. Um, and then 
His Holiness in in the How to See Yourself as You Really Are is giving commentary on on um, well at least on the first two thirds or whatever of this book of of what I was listening to in India. Um, and this is helpful, but again it's using the same uh, reasoning. And uh, Nagarjuna does this twofold reasoning. He stretches it to five, which is much more helpful. And Chandrakirti stretches it to seven, stretches it to seven, which is really beautiful. And so for that you have to buy another book, <laughs> which is the Emptiness Yoga book, really. And uh, um, but we'll we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll try to bring it to life uh, some, because reducing the reasoning to some grammatical point mm -hmm. uh, seems like pretty cheap for such a momentous thing to be decided. All right. Can seem cheap. Does seem cheap. But may not be cheap in the end. Yeah.